I am going to give you a little bit of an of a uh, sort of bring you to to this place where I am right now and to the work that I've made during my residency here at the North Fork. And I wanted to show you um, this James Baldwin piece that I finished a few weeks before I left. And um, just to give you a sense of, uh, and answer some of the questions that come to me very often is, you know, do, how do you pick the mask? Do you know, you know, which mask is gonna go with which celebrity, et cetera. And I owned this Chakwe mask that is on, and that's, you know, unfortunately I don't have a, um, a professional photograph of this painting since it's just recently been finished, but I like this particular photograph because it shows you the texture of the uh, cold wax medium that I use in the background of all of the African diva paintings. So I had this chocolate mask for almost a decade before I actually saw where it belonged when I, um, I found this Dimitri uh, Castorine, this 1979 photograph of James Baldwin. And I have text from in the background from um, Nothing Personal, uh, a, a short work that he did that had images as well by Richard Avedon. So that's kind of my process. Sometimes I see the mask and I know what celebrity I want it for. And you'll see that later on in the talk. And sometimes I know a mask belongs on a painting, but I'm not quite sure which one it is going to be on. So a little bit about me and writing and script and text and uh, performance and ritual and all that kind of stuff. I was raised Roman Catholic um, I, and I learned how to write and I'm have very good handwriting and it has stayed with me even into my adulthood. There is something about the um, order of cursive writing and also what it becomes after as you age and how much handwriting can say about you as a person as well as offer um, a graceful way of handling text. So yeah, that, that, that is me in, in my first communion outfit with an amazing image on the top of the sacred heart that if you step to the other side, it turns into the Virgin Mary. I'll tell you, we fought over who could who would inherit that little uh, piece that you see right there. But anyway, that, that, that's, that's something I want you to understand. Some things I'm sharing with you, I have had a lot of time by myself here in this residency and I had an opportunity to think deeply about why I make the decisions that I make and how is it that this African Diva project has lasted now for 17 years. Yes, 17 years. So I, so I have been sewing since I was in what they call Paul middle school now, junior high school. I used to sew my own clothes. Of course, now that doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense because it's not as inexpensive to sew your own clothes as it used to be. So that idea of, of uh, pageantry, of making your own clothes, making a statement with costuming, I believe that we all pretty much get into a costume every time we present ourselves in public. I wanted to share with you that I come from a family of people who love to dress up. This is a, a not so long ago photograph. That's my mom in red. And she uh, joined the ancestors 10 years ago. And this was a Christmas celebration and it was just us. And we dressed up for Christmas and sang and had a great time. And as children, we would put on holiday plays and pageants and dress up. And this was a part of my upbringing. And I grew up in a work class environment and yet we were able to have these kinds of good times without having a whole heck of a lot of money. Now about how I paint, I sit on top of my canvas. I work from uh, two dimensional for the most part. I work from two dimensional objects from photographs and I, pre I prefer to work from hard copy. I have worked from digital and because I couldn't find hard copy for an image that I was excited about, but I work right on top of my canvas. This is also a, a 2021 piece that was finished uh, Josephine, of Josephine Baker. 
And I also, when I am working, I make a mess of myself. I'm pretty neat. Everything around me will be very neat, but I clean my brushes on my clothing. And so these have become kind of artifacts. These, this, this, this pair of pants and this shirt have become artifacts and they wash really nicely and the colors stay the same. So, you know, oil paint on cotton, no problem. It, the traces will never go away. How do I choose who I want to turn into a diva? So I choose very often because of the music. This is Emily King. Uh, she is not what you would call a big star. And uh, if Solio is in the room or when he watches this later on, it, I asked Solio to help me choose which one of her songs, the background, uh, the lyrics for Colorblind is in the back, but I really liked her music. And so I, looked to her music to lead me to the image. And she, it turns out she's quite attractive and quite a fashionista. And this image was on a CD and it was tiny. So I had to work from that, which was kind of a struggle. She wears a, a beautiful miniature pende mask. It would have been uh, something that would have been worn as a pendant. And that's an image of the, narrow space that I work in, in my home studio. So here at North Fork, I had had almost three times as much space to spread out, uh, to make different things, to have several things going at the same time. I do though really miss living with my collection. I have what I have found, it's a modest collection of uh, African art. And I started that collection for, uh, to offer as show and tell, to take into to class when I was teaching. And it has become a very big part of the inspiration for what I do. And so I work with these objects around me. I haven't collected much lately. Um, let me go back, go back. This is a piece that I just recently um, acquired for my collection. And one of the things that I have looked to in having some kind of sort of brackets around what I collect is works that have um, positive female uh, women in uh, use and imagery. And this is a mask that was recently taken over by women, by the Izzy and Ebo women. And so even though they are carved and the, the carvings of masks it continues to be a male enterprise, these, are, these masks are now danced by women. So it was one of those things that when I had an opportunity to include it in my collection, I jumped on it. All right, so let's go forward. So, I do appreciate the performative nature of my work and I have looked to and been given opportunities to bring the African Diva project out into the open and onto the stage. So No Longer Empty gave me an opportunity to do this in one of their summer exhibitions. And so I dreamed up this idea of having, uh, giving the audience members an opportunity to become an African diva by, by lip syncing or singing with a mask um, and to get dressed in those dressing rooms, there were gowns and it was an amazing success. Um, an amazing success, much more amazing than I expected it to be uh, that hundreds of folks over that summer came through to perform on the stage, their favorite songs, and to become African divas. And Drea, I know you're here, and there is, is uh, Drea St. Clair, who was uh, performed opening night, and that is me on the corner. And then these are folks from Jamaica and all parts of Southeast Queens who came to this, what was an, an empty retail store that became an exhibition space. It was wonderful. And that kind of began my journey of wanting and accepting opportunities to bring the African diva imagery out into the open. The MTA 
Uh, the New York MTA was very helpful in doing that. This was a, a, a temporary exhibition that was at Jamaica Center right outside of the subway. I had uh, Link New York uh, flashes for a month. Um, I show you one that's static so you can see what they say. And that was awesome too. But the thing is that I am looking for ways that audiences that don't necessarily go into galleries and, and go into museums to experience what I do, but to experience the transformative nature of engaging with a work of art. If, I, if, if I'm not tr transformed in some way by a work of art, I, I have passed it. I, I spent a lot of time in museums um, and I learned how to paint more from the masters than anywhere else, from looking at surfaces of paintings and following what they did and how the tricks that they made with paint. So I know what it means when you just, two, two seconds, you don't even stop in front of a painting because it doesn't speak to you. It doesn't have anything to say. And I want my work to have that opportunity. I also had a chance to put the African divas as cutouts this is the Jamaica Performing Arts Center on Jamaica Avenue. Uh, I had a temporary, uh, I, this was an art site grant that I got and they were fenced, they were put on the fence. And uh, unfortunately, someone wanted to try and take one of them home. And what I found, there was, at first I was, actually I was very upset by it at first. And I put that sign that says vandals hurt all of us. But I also understood what it meant to see something that you think you can make your own, that you think that you can take home with you because it's there, it's just like there out in public. There is um, a need to educate audiences that are in these working class areas and these areas that are being gentrified that they need to have respect for the work that they see, but they also need to have respect for the next person who can't see it properly because it's been destroyed. So that's, as an educator, that has also been a part of what I do and how I think. So again, moving into a way to make the project more accessible to more modest collectors and also more accessible to show. So I got this catalog for the um, Black Glamour Mink story from a friend ooh, at least 15 years ago. It marinated on my shelf for at least a decade before I figured out what it was that I was supposed to do. And as you see, there's 20 of the many um, Black Glamour legends that were here and two of them, 4%, are black. This is Diana Ross and Lena Horn and why this is one to be so sensitive. And one day I stumbled on Wolf and that did it. I went back to the catalog and I said, now it's time for me to do something with these images. Why they chose Lena Horn. This came out in 1986 as a spoof, the Bart Glama. Why they chose Lena Horn out of all of the black mink celebrities, I do not know. And that is what got me going, that I needed to do something to change that, to, re to address that. And these are the two that were on the cover. That's um, Diana Ross, who actually has been diva, diva eyes many times and uh, Lena Horn in a mask that is in my collection. And then I said, we're gonna do more. We're gonna, we're gonna make this public. And I'm, I, I am married to an absolutely amazing photographer and installation artist, Jacqueline Herans Brooks. And she is into street art. And she planted this idea that I should make stickers. So I did 50, I've made 50 stickers and I started giving them to friends and colleagues, put them outside, 
we're going to get the message out there. The African Diva Project is happening. Um, you might have noticed right by now that I have changed what becomes a legend most, which was the seller for the mink. The mink becomes a legend most to who becomes a legend most, which is probably one of the reasons why I haven't been chewed up by the copywriters. Anyway, so these are just some of the images that some, some of the folks who took my, um, my stickers out into the street. I have a lot of them. And that was a really fun project, but then what do you do? What do you do next? So I made them into playing cards. Now I didn't have enough black divas to become a full deck. So what I did, I had all but two. These, this was a run they did of, of um, Broadway performers in Mink. So I had those three and two were missing. So I had to fabricate two. This is Aretha, who's number 10. And of course, Queen Latifah, who is the queen. And Ray Charles, who was the only male in the series that was the black male that was in the series, he is the king. And, and I found a useful wolf, who is the Joker. So this was a fun idea. Uh, you know, sometimes I need to push myself to figure out how the work cannot be so precious, even though people who have gotten these cards refuse to play with them. I have played with them. Yeah, and, and they're actually really good. They're good poker cards, poker quality cards. Anyhow, so in my mind, I'm just trying to share with you that in my mind, I want the work to do more than just hang on the wall or to, you know, to hang on a wall in a private space. I know that the paintings need that because they need to be protected, but the imagery and the ideas around the African Diva Project needs to be out in public. So I'm gonna cycle you back a little bit now so that you can see where I started. I started with album covers. The, what I call side A was to be 33 and a third paintings, all square format, all taken from album covers. And you can see my excitement over patterning and I, I shared with some friends recently that I've been down a rabbit hole trying to find those T-strap shoes. I still haven't found them. If anybody's got clues, send them to me. Uh, and this was the third. Diana Ross, as I told you, I've done Diana a couple of times. So she was the third of the Supremes and the canvas, if it was all three of them, would have been 60 by 60. So, and then I said, I did this. I did this project. I had the idea, I did this project, is it over? No, not over, wasn't over because the suggestions and then the images kept coming. Um, this is, this is a, a, a painting that was done pretty deep into side B. If those of you who are old enough to remember LPs, they had a side A and a side B. I know there's a, you know, analog is coming back, but you know, probably never as deep as it was part of my life as I was growing up. But I saw this image of Solange on the front of the Times Style ma Magazine and I saw Barbie. And there was something that said, this is amazing image, but what's going on? How, are we, how is this giving us a sense of the talent of this beautiful and amazing singer? Um, and I like Solange's work a lot. So I hope that you can see that this one has a miniature Dan mask and she also has synthetic hair attached to it as well. There was something for me in putting a, an African mask on these figures brings them to a higher level, gives them a dignity that is for me very often missing in how I see them portrayed um, in, in, in the commercial press. This is Billy Porter. Uh, another question that people have asked me is, you know, why this mask on that figure? I have done a few male figures. Um, they've been, uh, with the uh, exception of, of Ray Charles, they have been gay men. 
And uh, this mask is representing um, a very deep and serious sort of gender bending practice in African masquerading. This is a maiden spirit mask. And I show you an image of the, the lead of a troop of these masks and the intricacy of the, the patterning and the costuming with prosthetic breasts that one that they go through in order to come out into the open and perform. And so with the costuming that Billy Porter is known for, and in the background is the lyrics for the song he wrote for the 50th of Stonewall, which was Love Yourself. And I, you know, I, choose the, I chose this lavender background to um, honor that moment as well. But Billy Porter is non-binary in his costuming. And he has brought that out to the fore to be a way to rethink how we present, how celebrities present themselves. Uh, this is a large painting. I had one hell of a time with it, enjoyed it very much and it presents beautifully as well. So I feel that it honors him and it honors the mask as well. And my sense of need to have a challenge with each painting is, is, is has to do with my, my need to be inside of patterns. Um, my excitement over creating the illusion of texture. Uh, and believe me, I, there are times when I've started and, and, and had to check my sanity um, as to why these are two from, from uh, side A, uh, from album covers, Dionne Warwick and Shirley Bassey. And I questioned myself while I was here on this, um, this adventure in this residency, why do I do that to myself? And it's because I grew up with stuff like that. I, was, I grew up in a family of puzzlers. This was my brother's puzzle for Christmas. He put this monster together. As you can see, there's a wine glass on the side there kind of helping him along. But I grew up in a family of putting puzzles together. And it starts as an image that's full and done, and then it gets torn apart. And the reason why I brought that up, sit with me, is because I find myself doing that in other work. This is the, the work that the EFA shift residency allowed me to pursue when I set aside the African divas and it was a shredding process. I shredded uh, letters from my past two spouses and then could not throw them away. So I made them into works of art. And uh, I also have a project of, of um, photographing unmade hotel beds that I've slept in. Some of you might've heard about that. And the reason why I'm showing you this, you'll see later when I show you what I made here, is that I came up with this idea and I, I destroy and then I put things back together. I destroy and then I make things look right destroyed. I came up with this idea of etching into the acrylic face that would be in the frame. So what you're seeing there is a stylus cutting into the acrylic and those are my journal entries for those days that I was putting together those frames. So it took a little while, it's not as easy as writing with a pen, but it does the job. And there is the um, installation view from We Turn, which was the 2021 shift exhibition. And there is the grid in the back there of all of the unmades that I had um, torn the edges of the photographs and then put them in these. So I make things pristine again, even though I do go about with some level of destruction. And I like words and you see my hand, that's my handwriting all over a, a turtleneck shirt for another exhibition. But these are also, these are, I journal. These are, these are two journal pages from several years ago when I started drawing because I needed to draw from life. I kept thinking that maybe I was going a little too far with staying just within two dimensions to two dimensions. So these are two objects that I, I, I own, a, a rosary and a seahorse. And I painted, I drew them and used all kinds of different color sources 
to put them on the paper. So I'm taking you here now. I went to see Karen Mae Weems at the Park Avenue Armory before I came here. I was totally moved by what this woman could do to bring you into a place where you recognize what is going on right now and how we need to get through it and change it. Um, that was a very good thing for me to have done. And then I found out that I'm actually named as one of the artists in the, in the Art in America Guide of 2022. It's just my name, but it's actually there. And that was one of the things that was on my bucket list. So it's like, okay, now I'm gonna go to this residency and this happens. And I, of course, you know, did interview for this gig and I am totally thrilled that they chose me to be the next Dean. But I got to say, I'm still processing um, that this is the next step for me in academia and that I will have an opportunity of leadership to actually make a difference for the next generations of artists that are coming forward. I'm, I'm totally psyched about that one. So here I am. I'm inside of this little house right now talking to you, right? The first night I got here, it was in the 40s. Not so bad. I mean, it, that is a doornail on the North Fork. This is a summer hangout. Walked down to the water. You know, my wife came with me. She helped me settle in. Everything was good. She took photographs of me. And let me tell you, if you see a photograph of me at work, she's the one who took it. But I'm horrible with selfies. So she has been the most wonderful visual archivist that I have, could have ever wanted to have. So here I am, first day, I mean, I'm working. I'm working that next morning and then she left. And then I was alone. And then I had to deal with not being able to say, did you hear that? To anybody, <laughs> you know? Learning the sounds of a place where you are literally the only one in it. And so whatever you hear, either you made it or something you can't see made it. But that only lasted for a short time and then it snowed. And I like snow as long as I don't have to drive in it. I like snow. And this little piece, this piece right here, I tacked up the second canvas. I've never worked off of a stretcher before ever. And I knew I could not finish these paintings here because the cold wax can't roll. And I knew I had to stop painting so that things could dry. So I got into a rhythm. Some of you might've seen, we have posted along the way. I, it, I decided to do my very first more than one image, more than one figure on, on the canvas. And of course it's a Supreme. So Diana's there again. And what came with this album is this wonderful, uh, pamphlet history of Diana Ross and the Supremes. And could you stand the irony that they were actually on white bread plastic? Look at that. I mean, I'd never seen this image before and it was in this pamphlet that came with the LP. So you know, with the LPs, we learned so much. And uh, this is pretty much where it is now. I think you can still see it behind me. There's three of those masks. I only brought one of them with me. It's a Puno mask, which is from Gabon. And what's interesting about that mask is that it is danced by men, for men. Women are not allowed to see it perform. And it is danced on stilts. So these wonderful yellow high heels just Kind of fit right in there for me. The irony around how things are mixed together and how they work out and how they tell their own story is, is, is pretty fascinating for me. Um, and then Chuck, if you're around, Chuck is, I follow Chuck Muncy on Instagram and he follows me. And wouldn't you know, now Ronnie Spector just passed. So the Ronettes are pushing through to get on the list of African divas now that I'm considering doing uh, groups. And so I'm gonna show you the four, well, five that I did while I was here. That's Esther Jones, who was the original Betty Boop. And this is Tony Braxton. 
And they are, those masks are actually photographs. I had started collecting photographs of masks to use in collaging the albums that I did not paint. That's how it started. And then I came up with this idea of framing them in a very opulent manner and then labeling them so that they would look uh, like these kinds of works of art that are uh, from the 19th century, the salon style, the, you know, the big gold frames with the labels on there. It's all very special, all very precious. Um, but unfortunately, that wonderful Italian frame that I was using, they discontinued it. And so while I was here, I decided to collage one of the paintings from the actual first side, from the first 33 and a third, um, with a more uh, subdued frame, but still quite beautiful and gold and labeled. So that is what I'm going to do next with what I, my album inventory. But remember, I showed you the etchings. This is FK Twigs whose work I really like. She is so funky. I adore her work and her voice. And so I did this drawing and the drawings were monotone. I was going to try and do, you know, monotone blue, monotone black, monotone. They're all watercolor pencil with some brushwork. The lovely thing about watercolor pencils is that you can come back in with a wet brush and you can move things around. I kind of am lost without a brush. So I need a brush. And so what I did was to write the lyrics of three of her songs across an 18 by 24 piece of plexiglass. And so when it is framed, it will be behind this. And if it's lit properly, the, 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 the script will push across the image itself. And that is my stop, but I'm gonna finish showing you what I did. Um, I think I posted this one on Instagram, Sade. Um, she was the fourth of the drawings that I did. I, I had to get back to color. There's something about working with skin tones that really makes me happy. And um, I decided to go back to using color, even though she is dressed in, in, in black and white and use one of the uh, photographs of the mask that I had. That's a, a, a Luena mask from Angola. And the last painting, which I kind of showed you, is, is um, Nina Simone, and not from an album, and Nina Simone looking fierce. This is a very low resolution image that I found online. And I could not pass up turning this into a diva. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to keep the Dan mask that's tech. It's tacked on there right now. I had to stop painting it so that it could be rolled. So it's not even near finished, but there's something about leaving the hands as being the most articulated there and having the rest of the body be less so. I might actually do that, which will be pretty much new for my, um, my work and my project as well. And so this is my uh, wallpaper for my, my uh, computer for the last two years. And as far as I'm concerned, if my work can't be a part of this, I don't want to make it. Thank you. Okay. Questions. I see that there is some, let's see. All right, thank you for all the congratulations. Everybody ask me a question. Somebody ask me a question. Thank you. And thank you for liking the presentation. Yeah, really strong work, Margaret. Thank you for sharing all that. Thank you. I'm, I, am I interested in working with other materials, other kinds of materials? Um, do you mean going beyond two-dimensional or? Um, Therese, 
come on, come on and, and, and share with me more of what it is you're referring to in terms of materials. Yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier in your talk about um, working with sewing machines. So I was wondering if you were interested in working with like fabrics or other kinds of like textured materials in your work. Actually, that's a really good question. At present, no. Um, I've, I've pretty much just been using the sewing machine for garments and for things for the home, that kind of stuff. But I, I have the additive, like the hair that I have added, the synthetic hair that I've added. I think about how that can be maintained. Uh, how it gathers dust and stuff like that. You know, this is this is how my mind works. Um, a lot of artists was like, oh, let them deal with it. You know, <laughs> let whoever wants to take it home deal with it. But I have, I, I think about what it is that fabric, working with fabric does to the future of the work of art. Like I own a wonderful quilt and I have to put it behind plexiglass in order for it not to gather dust and start for the color to start deteriorating. So I, I'm very happy with how permanent oil can be if it's handled properly and how permanent the African mask itself can be as well. But thanks for that question, I appreciate that. Hi, Margaret. I don't have a question. I just want to just say congratulations. I think this is incredible. And Thank you, incredible. Mark. And why don't you have a question? This was a very questionable presentation. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> well, well, if I were to have a question, are you going to continue to go forward on doing male masks going forward? Male artists? Um, male Male, male, I, male, yes, male I probably will, but it, it's so like I have had several images of Lil Nas sent to me, who is quite a performer who costumes in a very big way, is very spectacular. Um, but I have not, in all the images I've seen of him, and he's photographed a lot, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't okay, seen okay. my image yet. So yeah, I don't, I don't really. I started out based, basing the project on um, women, but it's really about performers. So that's what that's what I, I mean. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm open. I'm really and, open. And and and, and, yeah. and all of them, all of the performers, a lot of them I've worked with over the years. I know. But, I'm jealous. But, but, now turn, yeah. turn off your mic. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> But but and and I love it and 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 I think you did Sammy Davis Jr. Right? No, not yet, not yet. But now what you. What was the male play. artist that you did? You did one. Was it I Louis did, Armstrong? I, I did. Uh, no, Ray Charles is in the Black. Flag. Okay, Ray Charles. I did yes. Billy Porter. I did RuPaul. And mm -hmm. those are those are the two males so far. Um, who? I love who it. I love. It. I love it. Because you know what stands out to me the most is the 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 mask itself. Ah, ah, no, nah, no, nah, I don't make the mask. I put the mask there because I want those African. Yes, but artists, how you paint it and how African you, the, 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 the concept is brilliant. That's all I'm saying. The Thank you. Thank you. And, One of the things never. about adding the actual mask is that I am presenting the mask. I'm not representing the mask. Yes, I understand. You know? and, the, and that, the, that works for the, me. The, the way you do it is just awesome. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Somebody wants Bob Marley. I don't know. Ziggy might not be too happy about that. Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. Margaret, are you hearing me? It's Nicole. Yes. Hi, Nicole. Hey. Hi, Don. You know, to, to sort of continue on with that a little bit, because actually I think it's important the way the Billy Porter um, portrait sort of really re sort of resituates the viewer to maybe the complexity of the mask and sort of maybe uh, questions about um, gender roles in 
sort of West African societies mm -hmm. um, and really how actually, in a sense, that conversion to those roles in those societies in, uh, in terms of women and women of color in the Americas, um, mm -hmm. the challenges right now, I think out of all of, uh, all of them, it's the one portrait that's making me think of the possibilities of really the viewer um, entering into that, you know, and making the connection between sort of um, um, sort of the complexity of those those societies, and and maybe wanting to know even more and reconnecting in a sense. Yeah, yeah. One of the questions Solio asked too is that can I share more about the research uh -huh. aspect of of the um, the mass itself? And I, I I have to share that I am pretty much a self taught Africanist. I have taught African art, but I've never taken a course in mm -hmm. African. So mm -hmm. I have learned what I have learned from my own viewing through the museums. I've been very fortunate when I when I taught at uh, at BU and at Wellesley. I spent time at the Peabody. I could go into the back rooms and get close up and see things closely with my students. So a lot of what I know about African art are, is coming through other people's research, and in 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 short order, most of that research from the 20th century has been done by, by whites, mm. by yes. outsiders. We now have some very prominent African Africanists who are writing about African art, uh, Chica, Roland, Abiyadon, but mm -hmm. there aren't, when I was coming up, they weren't as published and as recognized. So my research really does go into, well, what does this mask say before I put it on my painting? And I am not using antiques on my paintings. They are um, usually sort of work that was made and heading to the market. And some of them are not uh, sized in the way that they would be sized if they were going to actually be performed in Africa. So much of the ceremonies, the rituals have been lost through colonialism, mm -hmm. through the missionary movements throughout Africa, so that even Africans can't tell you too much about the works of art, about the masking and about the backgrounds. So I do what I can and if I find that my painting isn't simpatico with a mask, I will set that painting aside until I find the appropriate mask. Uh, yeah, I just think that that Billy Porto one, I feel like the way that he, sort of the way that he has sort of taken on this non-binary sort of existence uh, makes me think of sort of the because I had I had African art history whatever that is in grad school and the more that the more that I have moved forward in my own art realized how much of an influence that really did have on my practice as well even if I wasn't aware of it you know and I think really and truly what you were when you were just talking about um, that piece it triggered that in my head, like sort of remembering something about sort of um, some of the masks rituals and actually that his his existence and the way that he is living is sort of living maybe possibly some of the aspirations of the so sort of those performances of those masks in those societies. Ha, you go. Give me a break. How do you? <laughs> Fine diva. I have been asked that question so many times and I probably answered it every time different. Um, how do I define a diva? A diva is a performer. And uh, I mean, we don't, you don't have to be a paid performer either. I mean, some of us are divas because we believe that what we have to offer, everyone should have access to. There is something about a diva that is expansive. Mm -hmm. You know, that they feel that the reach of their talent should be out there. It takes a lot of guts to get up on a stage. A yep. lot of guts, even if you have a hit record. 
you know, that there is that chance that you won't reach the audience, you won't keep the momentum. So I see these, these people and they're not, they're, there is no gender attached to diva. You know, there isn't. You, it is someone who believes in the power of what they have to offer, mm -hmm. whatever that might be, whatever that might be. It's, hey, um, I, I would, I, I know that it has been um, bandied about as something that's negative. Oh, you're being such a diva. And, you know, we see it on, on television. We see it in, as a wonderful ad with Aretha where she's called a diva and, and she slaps somebody, you know, mm. and then they give her a Snickers bar or something to shut her up. But, you know, that, that idea of a diva being boisterous and being out of control, sometimes you just got to be out of control. Sometimes you got to take what you got and be a bit out of control in order to get the attention that you need to do the work that you're here for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see my divas as those kinds of people. Yeah. Those, well, those last people. were about transcendence, right? Whatever the performance was, it was always about transcendence. And I think that's, that's the aspect of the divas that really and truly you're engaging. Ah, yes, indeed. Um, Thank so, you, Mary, uh, for that idea of an audience walkthrough with translucent projection. You're killing me, girl. Who oh, you think I am, Carrie I'm, I'm not Carrie <laughs> Way. <laughs> yeah, give me some bucks. If I have some money, there's a whole lot of things I could do with those divas. But thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I'm, Margaret, you know, I'm, I'm, from that, you know, I'm from that generation of looking at album covers while listening to LPs. Oh. I, I miss that that whole process, right? We're in the same um, place, my friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only thing I don't on... miss is the tonnage. Yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. <laughs> but there's something to be said about looking at an album cover and then finding yourself while listening to the music drawn into the artwork. And that's how I feel when I look at your work. And I also know that being a uh, derivative of album cover art or inspired by album cover art. Um, it gave me this thought about walking through these corridors and having this sort of uh, translucent image of these works. I mean, they're, they're so dense and rich in their appearance that they can't be, in one sense, they can't be penetrated. And yet there's something penetrable in the idea of imposing or superimposing this, this uh, diva-like image over someone's body. And that's what gave me that idea of just walking through these corridors while the music is playing in the, and the I love it. I love it. I want so I want to do it. I want to be in so, that. So That's we'll get the funding. We'll get the funding. <laughs> it Jeannie, will Jeannie, you're asking a question about the um theater uh as relevant. Absolutely. And poetry, well I I have uh James Baldwin, I have done Tony Morrison who are both writers and as far as I'm concerned, performers. And you mentioned Amanda Gorman and I've had Amanda Gorman suggested to me before as well. Of course, it's all theater. It's all theater. I mean, even though we go to listen to a singer, it's all theater. We're watching performances of musicians making their art for us in that moment. So yeah, absolutely. Theater is a, is a big part of what, what I do. And I think that theater is a big part of what we do as artists as well. We're always being asked to perform as artists, especially those of us who push ourselves out into public, that we are asked to perform uh, ourselves as artists. And it's not always fair to do that to someone who is, is, is making work and it's the work that they want to speak for them. Uh, that was something that Barté said all the time. I want my work to speak for me. I don't, I don't want to be the one that's speaking. That's why I go through all the trouble of making these things. Thank you, Atim, for that, I, that information about the Ekpe Society in Nigeria. Most definitely the, the, um, the male masquerades using female items. Yeah, a lot has changed in Africa, but not everything and not actually most things uh let's see margaret can i just ask you a question um sure. so uh, i'm curious about the next phase of your career 
And I'm wondering how being an educator of young artists will impact your body of work, or if you see that happening. Um, I am going to say that, that thus far, I've been an educator all along, and now I'm going into a, a leadership position um, that is even uh, more elevated than where I was at, at your college at CUNY. And the thing is that the students would always come to me when they had an opportunity to see what I do. You'd be surprised how many students don't bother to check your website. I don't know what's up with that. You know, if any of my professors had websites, I would have been in there anyway. But, you know, the stu my students have come to me and said, you know, why are you doing this if you are an artist that can work like that? And I think what I bring to the table is that you can be a lot of things and make a lot of contributions based on what you know and where your talents lie and where your interests lie, and that you don't need to put blinders on when you have made a choice that you want to be a visual artist. And so I think that that is probably one of the sort of mental things that will happen, but I'm probably not gonna paint as much. Margaret? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Hi, I just actually this is a good follow up to that. Um, I did put in the chat about when is Margaret going, is going to become a featured diva, and I'm asking this question. Um, it's not facetious at all. I do think that um, as you're talking about performance, academics are performers, right? And mm -hmm. I I recently listened to even a um, a conversation from Ahi Rooks um, around the the um, the the joke, <laughs> um, the ship. And she had this hashtag about citing black, hashtag cite black women. And as you're talking, I couldn't help but think about even with the gender stuff and how women can just perform with the masks. And I, and just think about for you, um, how it's gotten, it seems to have just gotten greater later for you. And you have <laughs> this body of work that is a part of your own personal archive. And it talks to you and you don't, you didn't throw away certain things that didn't speak to you. You had something on the shelf. I can't remember. I'm just, you know. I always have stuff on the shelf. Exactly. And, and it speaks to you at certain times. And I want to just talk, if we could hear a little bit more about, I noticed that you kind of already answered it about what's next for you in, you, in this new um, iteration of your life. Because I remember talking to you, you're talking about retirement. You're talking about this and the third. And this is the <laughs> total opposite of retirement. It's like a new career for you as you thought you're, you know, winding down in your professional life. So if you could talk about, you know, fostering other creatives, but what it means to you now to have this higher platform and then also um, to bring other women and other women artists up and also, you know, to celebrate yourself with that self portrait as a diva that you are. Ah, phew. Okay. Well, first I'm my, my, my main agenda in taking, in accepting the position at Tufts at, at the school is to offer a platform for, for young artists, uh, who have never considered that historic school as a place to attend. That is what I want to see happen. I want to see that place opened up for more different kinds of, of artists, potential professional artists to consider. There, it has not been an open door for a diversity of, of young artists, um, be, be they immigrants or people of color or, um, you know, people with different abilities, et cetera. Um, and Tufts has convinced me that they are 200% into that initiative. So my agenda is lined up with theirs. I think I can be a role model for someone who is not impatient it took me a long time to get to this place. And it also took me a long time to get to a place where I could even apply for a residency because there was no time for me to give an entire month to making my art. And so I have 
uh, use this sabbatical, I'm on sabbatical right now, to reconnect with my work and to prepare myself for a different pace in my studio practice, but it's not going to go away. And I think it is significant that I will continue my practice as Dean of a school and that the students and, and my colleagues around me will see that you don't have to back away from what it is that helps you grow. Because that's what my painting practice does. It helps me grow. It, it, it leaves me in a place where I always feel like there's something new happening. You know, it never gets stale. I kept waiting for it to be done and it just never happened. So this, this is it, this is what I do. This is who I am and um, you folks make me feel very good about it. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate that you're here. I appreciate that you wanna know some answers for me. Um, and I'm hoping that all of you will have an opportunity to take a diva home. I'm yes. serious. I am dead serious about that. Talk to me, take a diva home, even if it's on loan. I'm, gonna, I'm at this place now where I have inventory and I want them out of storage, out of storage. So, you know, talk to me. Um, Dr. Vendries, um, will you ever miss the classroom? No, because I'll step in there every once in a while and check in there and see what people are doing. Now, I have the opportunity to teach if I want to, so I have no reason to miss it. I think what I am going to miss is the uh, demographic of students at York College. Okay. I'm going to miss that. I'm going yeah. to miss working with uh, all those students of color, all those different ethnic groups and different cultural groups and different sets of ideas around what they think an art history class is supposed to be like. Um, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll follow up on that. Is there is there a difference when you when you when you um, critique art and 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 when it comes from other places, other is there a difference? Um, um, I, if if I I think what you're saying is, am I sensitive to the fact that I might not know? as much as I need to know in order to do a fair critique. Well, 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 you know, but um, I, I, I'm in the same place because remember I told you when I do world music, um, I have people, um, students from all over the world. And it's, it's not about knowing because you're not going to know nine mm -hmm. out of 10 times. But you can know, you can, you can find out. Okay, okay. I, I mean, I'm a historian. I do oh, research. Oh, I you got can you. find yeah. out. I mean, if you, if you face off and engage with a work of art that you realize you might not be able to fully understand what is going on there, I fall back on being someone who looks, who does research. I never assume I that I know what I see. Art is not universal. As much as we would love to believe that it is, it's not. It's not universal. And I think that might be my last statement. <laughs> no, no. I got it. I got it. I understand. I understand. Um, I'm, 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 and and, and I'm, 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 I totally buy into it. I, I learned something. Yeah. yeah, but it should be transformative. That's what I okay. ask. If you okay. stop, you're being transformed. If you stop in front of a work of art, for whatever reason, you are being transformed. In, you know, embrace that involve yourself in it and enjoy it. Otherwise, those of us who make this stuff don't have a purpose. Got we it. don't have a purpose. I adore that's, you that's all. Awesome. That's Thank awesome. Thank you so much for this. Um, uh, you'll see me, you know where to find. I am so easy to find. It's kind of scary. So please engage with me. Um, follow me on Instagram if you aren't already. You know, let me know what you're up to and I'll follow you back. Um, be happy, stay safe, stay healthy. This whole COVID thing has helped us to understand how important we are to each other. So please, you know, do what you gotta do, but be safe while you're doing it, okay? Say goodbye. Thank you much, Margaret. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good Bye. job, great job, great Bye. job, thank you. Take care.